Good morning, friends. This is Steve from Southern Illinois again. It's sunshiny down here today, but the thermometer on my deck reads just above 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is not going to be a long drawn out affair today. <clears throat> but the good news is the daffodils are peeking through the ground. I hope that they don't get their tips frozen, but uh, there are signs that spring is around the corner. I lost a friend last week, one of our church members, and in a church as small as ours, we're all friends. She died suddenly, so quietly that her family at home didn't even realize she was gone. After fighting a failing heart and undergoing repeated heart surgery over 28 years, what I'm sharing with you today are the thoughts that I shared at her funeral this week. I have a grandson, and before the COVID era began, we went to visit him. He was almost two. And in the middle of the night one night, Vivian was up and she heard noises from upstairs at 1 a.m muffled giggles and laughter and baby boy talk along with groans and moans from mommy and daddy who were struggling to sleep. Vivian crept up the stairs and through the closed bedroom door she said quietly, Ethan, would you like to come down and play with grandma? And through the door, in his sweetest big boy voice, Ethan said, No, please. When big, almost two-year-old boys are awake, they don't like to be alone. And when mommy and daddy are present, it doesn't matter if they are awake. They want their attention. They do not like to be ignored. My friend made a request of me years ago. She had just gotten back from a major medical center after another bout with her heart. She just survived another heart surgery. And um, she came to me and she said, Steve, uh, if you t are asked to speak at my funeral, which caught me really off guard, if you are asked to speak, me, speak at my funeral, there are some things I would like to say, you to say for me, some things that I want my family to hear. So the rest of these thoughts are directly from my friend's request. The first thing she asked me to say was, give me a break. When I shared that with Vivian, she said, that's not something you say at a funeral. But I think you'll agree when I get done here that it was meaningful. You see, Christians have had a variety of opinions through the years, a variety of teachings about what happens at death. Before the Reformation, which was a few years before any of us were born, before the Reformation, every funeral servant, sermon preached the dead into purgatory. Purgatory. <clears throat> well, you see, Christ's death saves us from the guilt of sin. But before we can enter the heavenly kingdom, the stain of sin the effects that it's had on our lives, the habituation to sin that all of us experience has to be removed. And the only way that it can be removed is through suffering, through penance. This is a common human perception. We don't believe that someone has really repented unless we can see the suffering in them whether it be emotional or paying the price. 
Purgatory is a place of penance after death, a place of redemptive suffering as opposed to the punitive, the punishment of hell. But the Reformation changed all of that. Protestants rejected the concept of purgatory uh, and instead, well, they were of a divided opinion as to what happened next. So if you look at Protestant cemeteries from the early 1900s, you find them about evenly split. Some headstones um, re read some form of asleep in Jesus, resting until the resurrection. And other headstones uh, have some ver variation on I'm in a better place. I walked into heaven and it's great. Can't wait to see you here. As the evangelical revolution swept through Protestant circles here in America with its emphasis on saving people from everlasting hell, that difference of opinion in headstones has almost disappeared. And today, at funerals, people are almost always preached into heaven. When people think of day, death today, when Christians think of death today, they think of it as a transi transition from one life to another, a different form of life. And, and that, that perception, that uh, perspective on death is shared by our secular culture. Once again, our understanding of salvation uh, has shaped our perspective on death. Happy Sabbath to you too, DA. Our expectation of salvation has shaped our perspective on death, but that was not my friend's expectation. In fact, she would be disappointed right now if she found out that she was up in heaven looking down on her family living their lives here because the center of her life was helping people. And to her, seeing the people that she loved struggling, suffering, facing challenges, without being able to step in and help, it would be hell. And she had no expectation of experiencing hell in heaven. And that was reinforced by what she read in the Bible. The Old Testament prophet described death this way. The dead don't know anything. They have no joy. They have no sorrow. They aren't aware of what is happening in our lives. Their plans have all ceased. They can't interact with us. Jesus spoke of death consistently as sleep. And when he went to raise Lazarus back to life, he told his disciples, I'm going to wake Lazarus up. Both Paul and John described the death, described the dead as returning to life at a resurrection. Now, if you want to examine the Bible passages more, okay, um, Click over to the text talk that's going to accompany this devotional. It, I'll have the link in the, the comments. But my friend was looking forward to a good, long, uninterrupted sleep, if you will have it, until she hears the voice of Jesus saying, Wake up, Amanda. It's time to go home. Everybody's ready. And hence her message to her family, give me a break. Don't ask me to keep working on your behalf. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? It does me. Because you see, inside of myself, I find this big, almost two-year-old boy who doesn't want to be left alone. 
I was at church this week. We're just finishing a remodeling project and it's time for the cleaning crew to come in. And the thought passed through my mind, I'll have to ask my friend to organize this because she was the Martha of the church. She was the one who got things done. She, And then all of a sudden I realized, no, she's not here anymore. I'm alone. I have to do this. And I felt this angst of pain. No, please. I was just like my grandson. I didn't want to be left alone. When someone important in our life dies, we experience pain. I have a lot of friends who have, have had that happen, not just with COVID. People die for many reasons. In fact, all of us die, and that pain comes to all of our lives. Which brings me to the second thing my friend asked me to communicate to her family. You are not alone. Jesus loves you more than I did, and he will never leave you. My friend did not have an easy life. She wasn't born with a silver spoon in her mouth. She faced hardships, disappointments, betrayal. People let her down. People hurt her. But she learned that she was not alone. She learned three secrets of experiencing the presence of Jesus in her daily life. She read her Bible every day, not as a matter of duty or formality, not looking for Bible texts to prove what she believed or to support doctrine. No, she read her Bible daily to walk into the presence of Jesus. When he spoke to people and to their needs, he was speaking to her needs. When he cried with their pain, it was as if he was crying with her pain. When he laughed with their joy, did you know Jesus laughed? That is a secret that church folks keep even from themselves. But when she read of him laughing, he was laughing with her. She prayed every day, not formal prayers, not wish lists for Santa. For her, prayer was opening her heart to God sharing with her with him her deepest fears her passions her joys her sorrows the people she cared for and she came to church every week when her health allowed her to because church was where she learned and got support in loving people and in loving God better. It was her support group, it was her inspiration, it was her training ground. That is what church is supposed to be. Church is not about putting on your mask and coming and looking good. Church is not about comparing yourself to everybody else around you. Church is about meeting God and learning to love Him and love other people more. Which brings us to the third thing that my friend wanted said. <clears throat> you see, in heaven, she wanted her family to know that she's going to be looking for them. And it, it didn't matter to her whether her family uh, expected to go to purgatory, which is actually the majority view in Christianity today, I know, a shock for many Protestants. It didn't matter if they thought that they were going to get to walk directly into heaven when they died, or whether they thought they were going to be waking up on resurrection morning. She wanted them to know that she was going to be looking for them. And if they weren't there, she was going to be heartbroken. Because at that point, it won't matter what you and I have chosen to believe will be dealing with reality. I do not believe in alternative realities in heaven. It's going to be one reality, and that reality is Jesus. 
I'm going to be looking for you, my friends, that first day in heaven. And just like my friend with her family, if I don't see you, I'm going to be heartbroken. Because we may just be Facebook friends, but I care about you. I don't get on here to look good. I get on here to share what I have learned spiritually through my life. And all I can do is echo her words. If you have ears to hear, my friend, listen up. Be safe. Be prudent. The media is telling us that COVID is starting to recede and the numbers nationwide are dropping. But let me tell you here, the health system in Southern Illinois is almost on its knees. Hospitals are sh so short staffed that uh, only 70 to 80% of the beds are able to be, be, have nurses to, uh, to care for patients. And as a consequence, uh, even though our absolute numbers are dropping, we are still struggling to find room in the hospitals for people who are sick. Heart attacks, car accidents. So please be prudent. Don't let the positive wave mean that you stop your masking and your social distancing and all of the other precautions. Don't let the fact that we can now go back to church in groups of 50 cause you to, to stop taking the precautions because the threat is still real. But through it all, friends, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.